I have the pleasure of introducing Patricia Ryan Madsen on behalf of the Authors at Google program to share her improv wisdom with you. And then she's going to lead us in some games so we can see the lessons of improvisation in action. Patricia's a teacher. She's been teaching for over four decades. And in 1977, she came to Stanford, where then she became the head of the undergraduate acting program. And then she won the Dinkelspiel Award for her outstanding contributions to undergraduate education. And that is where I met her. I was lucky enough to be in her introduction to improvising class in one of her last years of teaching undergraduates. <laughs> and I remember the first day I came into the class, um, and she talks about this in her book, there was a sign on the wall that said, if you're not making mistakes, you're not doing improv. And that lesson really changed me. I had come from the perspective of an actor, excited to learn a new craft. And I think what I came away with and what I think everyone comes away with is learning that life is an improvisation. And that fact now seems obvious, but I think we often forget to be awake and be aware of the moment and listen to others as well as ourselves. And that is what Patricia teaches. So through her classes, and she does still teach through the Stanford Continuing Studies program. And also through her first book, Improv Wisdom, um, she gives us the, the ability to realize that we are all making this up as we're going along. And she reminds us to have fun while doing so. So please join me in welcoming Patricia Ryan Madsen. Thank you, thank you. Those of you who know Mamie know she's a remarkable young, let's see, I don't need that. A remarkable young woman, put this here. You can tell that I'm improvising because um, I'll be making mistakes all day. But I get credit for that in a sense because one of the things I'm trying to teach is to make mistakes in public. And I know that I'll be able to do that in front of you today. So um, um, I can count on the fact that I'll screw up at some point or at a lot of points. And I'm really, really nervous. Um, but I'm reminded that that is um, part of being human. Um, no matter how long I've taught or spoken or been in front of groups, I'm um, scared to death to speak. But I discovered that it was one of the five Buddhist fears. That if you recognize, in all humans, there are five fears that are universal, according to an Indian Buddhist writer. And the first is fear of death. The second is fear of loss of income. The third is fear of loss of reputation. The fourth is fear of loss of consciousness. And the fifth is fear of speaking in front of people. Or actually, it's speaking in front of the assembly is the way that it's written. And when you think about that, right up there with death is <laughs> what I'm doing right now, speaking in front of you. Um, uh, my huge conflict in coming here was that what I want to teach and model is to uh, just show up, don't prepare. That's the subtitle of the book. Um, don't prepare, just show up. And so in all rights, you would expect me to kind of come here free and just show up and see what happens. And that's sort of what I'm doing, but I've been um, preparing and preparing and preparing to just show up unprepared. Uh, one of the principles of improvising has to do with developing an eye of gratitude and of noticing all that we're receiving from others. And coming here to me is like um, a dream because Google has been enriching my life day after day for a very long time. And in fact, um, somewhere in the back of the book, I tell a story about writing a letter to Larry Page in, in the mid-90s to thank him. And I realized that um, what I wanted to do is to tell you just this week some of the things that your company has done for me, maybe you personally. Because Google isn't a thing, it's each one of you doing some part of the work that creates this extraordinary new world and extraordinary technology. And so I thought I'd tell you how, um, how Google has helped me and what it's done for me just in the last couple of days. I, if I told you what was happening for the last month, it would take the whole speech. So I don't want to do that. But it'll also give you a little profile of who I am and what I'm up to. So um, this week, um, 
Google, uh, I was able to find out the history of Google by Googling the history of Google, and I found a, um, a map through Google Maps to get to the campus today. Um, I was able to look at the other authors um, on YouTube and get absolutely terrified seeing um, what good jobs some of your other speakers have done and uh, realizing that I can't possibly rise to that. But I, 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 um, I freaked myself out by uh, watching many of those that were available. Um, I'm grateful for the Google blog search because I, um, I'm interested in knowing who's reading my book. And so every day I go to blog search and find out if, uh, if somebody's talking about improv wisdom, and they often are, so I'm able to go onto their blogs and thank them. Um, and plus there's some other, um, some other service that you provide that um, sends me emails when someone mentions improv wisdom on, on their blog. And so I was able to connect with, um, from such uh, a posting back to me with uh, a, a woman who was blogging about me on a site that uh, she's a professional beader. She makes beaded artwork and such, and uh, we've gotten to be really good friends. I want to thank you for that. I was able to, um, thanks to Google, check in on Delta Air Airlines for my sister. Um, I found out how the correct way to water a Christmas tree yesterday. Very good information about not adding the additives that I thought you needed. Um, the, the, uh, the best guess was just Pure water is better um, not to add any uh, um, bleach or anything like that. Um, I wanted to find out a particular subset of Purina cat chow for my cat. And uh, by going onto the Purina cat chow site, thanks to Google helping me find it, I was able to find just which particular pellets were the ones that my cat seemed to be eating. And that really made a difference. Um, we were able to compare digital uh, camera prices for my friends who were visiting from Canada and looking things up. We were also able, because of Google Earth, to go on and look up, um, see if, um, their new house in Gananoque and find the, uh, the amazing technology which lets us see, um, see our homes from, from space and closer. We were able to compare 30-inch gas ovens and their prices, etc. Uh, I was able to get the phone number for Repetto's, which is a place that sells Christmas trees to find out when they were, um, how soon the, uh, the big trees were going on sale. I um, was able to find the location and um, directions of how to get to the Insight Meditation Center last week. Um, I found a great corn casserole recipe that I was looking for. Um, and it's, uh, if you want to find a great corn casserole recipe, you just check out corn casserole plus Jiffy corn mix. Really good stuff. Um, I, with um, your service Stumble Upon, which is what I do when I get a little bored, uh, I stumbled upon a site that has a, um, a Viking cartoon with a cat with a Viking hat singing a Led Zeppelin song. It's really quite this one of those amazing silly things that um, allowed me, uh, my husband was really interested in that because he's a Viking and interested in genealogy. So this, this stumble upon Link tied us up with, uh, with his son who's also a Viking, I guess. Um, I was able to locate the uh, kiva.org um, site who, uh, Kiva's, some of you know, wonderful outfit that helps um, small loans to business owners in third world countries. If you haven't checked out Kiva, please do. Thank you for helping me find it. Um, I was able to discover that uh, Kenmore Stamps gives away um, 200 stamps for only $2. Use stamps to send. Uh, let's see. That's. Oh, yes, there were photos of the Google guy from our... Um, I was able to get the New York Times article. Thanks, and because I wanted to know more about my host who is coming. Um, I found out um, what were the main supermarkets in Richmond, Virginia, so I could order a, uh, a gift card for my uh, stepmom who lives there, and I needed a present for her, and um, didn't know which kind of supermarkets were there, but thanks to Google, I was able to find that out and find the address of how to get, the, um, get that. Um, we were able to find and um, uh, select a fireproof file cabinet from my husband's genealogy collection thanks to Google. We were also able to convert um, dollars and rupees. We have a, um, 
a sort of an adopted daughter in India, and so we, we sent her some dollars, and I never knew what it would turn out to be in rupees, so a currency converter helped me find out what the... She was getting a pretty good exchange rate, I was happy to see. Um, we found out how to find pond supplies, um, where to get water purifiers for our, our koi pond. I was able to find the mail order catalog for Gudrun's Jordan, a Swedish uh, catalog for women's fashions that I've been looking for. I found out, uh, thanks to Google, who was the CEO of PepsiCo this week. Um, because of the blessings of the Google desktop search engine, my own computer runs Windows XP, and I can never find anything except through the wonderful search engine that you all have provided. So I found a letter of recommendation that was hidden in my computer, thanks to you. Um, I found also the name and the phone number of the only motel in Noonan, North Dakota, where my husband was um, traveling and needed a place to stay. Just a couple more of these. Um, I, I was unsuccessful in finding an, a large-sized Altoids tin. They make them only once a year, and um, uh, Google tried to help me find it, but I didn't find it. The, we were able to find um, removal instructions for a Python Trojan horse uh, in our computer, thanks to Google. I was able to get information about pilot pens, a permanent marker for my watercolor class, and then I just discovered, checking things out, that I could download the Google Calendar from my desktop. So that's what you guys have done for me this week, and I want to thank you a lot. Um, it's, um, you're creating a new world. I was talking at lunch with Ming that um, when I went to college, there weren't any computers. Well, there were computers, but there weren't any personal computers. And I never had an email. I never, that was, uh, that was long ago. Um, before email, before faxes, before cell phones. In fact, is there anybody here who knows what layaway is? <laughs> a, a couple of folks, layaway, all right, was before credit cards. So if you wanted to buy something, um, you, you didn't proffer credit, but in the old days, you would go to a store and uh, pick out the coat you wanted and put $5 down, and then every week you'd put $5 more until you paid the $45 for the coat, and nine weeks later or nine months later, you could take your coat home. Um, the world's moving fast, as you all know, and I'm, I'm here not necessarily just to um, make a list of all of the um, wonders of, of Google, but I would be remiss if I didn't start with my appreciation of the details of what you were doing for me and others. It hit me at that point where I um, wrote to one of the, the founders uh, a letter of thank you, that all of this was coming to me free. It, it seemed um, uh, astonishing that the world that you're creating, the world of information, um, the world of, um, of help, of, uh, of play, um, of improvisation in a big sense, um, was um, coming out to all of us um, free. And it, it was uh, um, an example of the, the generosity of this company, which is one of the, one of the points of, of improvising. So, I'm here to represent the um, subject of improvisation, and um, perhaps I should tell you a little bit about how, um, this, is, this is my list of Google things. I do all of my teaching on these little tiny uh, fluorescent colored cards. And in fact, oh, there are the rest of them. They're in different colors. Um, they help me sort of notice things. If I'm teaching well, I never go into the class with more than, than one card with a couple of things on it. Right. Um, When we improvise, we're trying to make sense out of the moment. We're trying to take into account what's actually going on right now, you and me in this room, um, with some kind of hope or expectation that your um, half hour will, uh, will be profitable in some way. And certainly my goal would be to say something or work with you in some way uh, such that this 
time makes sense. Because we, um, one of the things I can say for, for certain is that we're all going to die and we don't know when. Now, I don't mean that to be um, sort of morbid, but it's a fact of life, of course, that we're, we're on this planet for just so long, and we don't know really how long that is. So it makes sense to me in recognizing that the fact of our own mortality that we try to use time well and not to waste it. And improvisers recognize that um, time is precious, and when they come on stage for a scene or something, they want to make something happen right away. Um, they don't wait for inspiration. They show up and begin something. And then once something is begun, there's a, a path that, that begins to appear. So um, part of the rules of improvising have to do with starting anywhere. It's why a player can take any suggestion and, and begin something. They're not looking for the right starting place or the perfect beginning. And I think this is a rule that can be applied to, um, to our work or, or our personal lives, that we don't have to always figure out the correct starting place, but if we begin, if we take a step in the direction of some um, project, some goal, even if we don't know where we're going, the first step will give us a new perspective for where the second step might be. But we, what we want to avoid is standing frozen, not moving, because we're not sure. How did I come to be teaching improv or finding out anything about it? Mamie mentioned that I came to Stanford in 1977. And one of the things I discovered was that Stanford students, um, bright, amazing young people, even in the drama department, were very, very good at following a script. And if you told them what you wanted them to do or gave them direction, they could follow it perfectly. They were masters and mistresses at, um, at, at finding the correct answer. But in the same drama class, if I'd sort of poke them and say, well, what do you think about that? What would, what would you think that the character might do here? There would often be a sort of puzzled look about, well, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, what, what should it be? What was the correct answer? So I saw that there was a gap between knowledge and, uh, and what was a proper response and what would be a, a reservoir of amazing ideas in my students that weren't, it seemed to me, weren't being tapped, or at least officially so. So I needed some way to um, help, help these bright Stanford students who wanted to give me the correct answer to discover any answer that they found or felt, to work with their own sense of what might be possible or true. And um, I started looking at information about improvising. I didn't know anything about it or that it was a methodology. But as um, the way of reality, if there's a need, sometimes information comes, begins to um, flow in to fill that need. I needed to find a way to help my students trust their own voices, if you would. Listen and, uh, and find out what was inside of their minds and imaginations. You could say something like to unleash their creativity or something like that. Um, but it just seemed to me that there was common sense, there was a, a way of being in the world that, that wasn't wedded to a set of correct answers. And that I was interested in trying to find out more about how to, um, how to access that. At lunch today, May asked me, what, um, what are, how do you teach creativity? Well, creativity is a kind of an abstract. I think what you can do is create conditions where our better creative selves can work. And that's one of the things about the Google culture and the environment. There's a lot here that is conducive to things happening in a creative way. Um, when, um, so I started studying improv with a man named Keith Johnstone in Canada and learned something about the techniques that are applied uh, improvisation for theater. Now, um, let me just check this out. When you 
hear the word improvisation, what, what comes to mind? What, what, do you, what would sort of follow that? Improvisation and what? Anybody? Spontaneity. Spontaneity, yeah. Variation. Variation, yes. Humor. Humor, yeah. Playful, together. Playful working together, good. Ouch. Ouch? <laughs> Ouch, yeah. Um, if you had the choice of whether to prepare something carefully or improvise it, um, how many would rather prepare? Raise your hands if you'd rather prepare. How many would rather improvise? Okay, about half and half. That's good. That's a large number of people who uh, um, would think improv sounds like a good idea. That's nice. For me, improvisation is, um, is a way of doing things. You could call it a, a DAO. Um, it's a methodology. Uh, the scientific method is a methodology. It has sort of rules and structures. For me, improvising is a, an approach to doing anything. You can improvise a project, or you can improvise a meal, or you can improvise a conversation. In fact, as I speak now, my words are improvised. I really don't know what the end of the sentence will be if I'm speaking naturally. If I had memorized this speech, then I, my speech would not be improvisational. Most actors who are performing a text from a play aren't improvising, but they're improvising the spirit of the character or the emotions or something underneath the lines. But human speech, by definition, is, uh, is improvisational. By the way, please come and go as you need to. Um, this, um, I'm happy to actually see people who need to leave and come and go, as, um, so don't feel uh, that there's some end that you'll miss if you, uh, uh, if you need to go back to a project. After working with undergraduates um, at Stanford and discovering that there was a real hunger for finding out ways of improvising, I got invited to teach for Stanford's continuing studies program, and that's the adult education wing at Stanford. And when I was invited, um, it was in 1992, I said to the uh, then dean, I said, I'm, I'm really not sure adults are going to want to show up and play improv games. Um, well, let's run it up the flagpole and see what happens. So we did, and um, a lot of people showed up. They began playing the improv games. And a curious thing happened. At the end of most classes, someone would stay afterwards and say, you know, what we're doing here really um, gives me some insights. Uh, and um, you can apply this stuff to your life. Golly, aren't we improvising our lives? So the, the, so the long story is that um, 15 years of teaching improv for adults led to the writing of the book, which I see many of you have now. I'm so delighted that Google provided some copies for you. Because the maxims of improvisation that I've come to uh, discover are outlined here and uh, with some games and exercises that you can, um, you can try things out. Well, I've already been talking for a bunch of minutes, so we need to do something. Um, I'm less good at talking at you than I am in doing something with you. So I wanted you to know that I brought everybody a present. Um, they're all wrapped, of course. And the thing is, each of you has that present sitting on your lap right now. So if you'd put down anything else you've got and take hold of their shoebox size, you notice. Everybody's got a, a present that's uh, the, sh the size of a shoebox here. Do I see everybody holding on to it? Kind of lift them up, right? Everybody, real good, yeah. There's a question back there. Oh, oh, you're holding it on the air. Very good. Yeah, he's holding his hands. All right, great. We've all got, we've all got a present here of some sort. Now, uh, they're wrapped. And the thing about when, when we're improvising, trust your very first thought. Um, it's not necessary to try to think up a good idea or come up with anything. Instead, whatever seemed to be the wrapping that you saw on your package, let it be what it is, is the way I describe this. So it's wrapped in a certain way. So the first thing I'd like for you to think of is what do you think is in the box? Come up with what you think might be in that package, given its size and the weight that you feel now. OK? Everybody got an idea of what's in the box? Yeah. OK. And, and don't struggle too hard. Go ahead and let your mind accept whatever you think it is. All right? Cool. 
Now, in a moment, we're all going <clears> to <throat> open, our, open our boxes, and as we do so, be mindful of the, of the wrapping and the bow or whatever it is, and be sure you put it somewhere. Treat this very carefully uh, as the real package that it is. We're all going to take time, unwrap the package, turn the box over, open it, and find out what's there, okay? Now, at the moment where you find out what's there, uh, just reach right into the box and take it right out. See what it is. The only thing I can tell you is whatever it turns out to be is not what you just thought is going to be in it. it it's anything else we don't know, and it, it'll, um, if it surprises you, that's great. Oh, don't try to fix it. Just open the box and see what's there. Okay, so let's go ahead and open our packages right now. I've got one, too. Everybody got something? All right. Cool. We're going to have a little fast show and tell here. So we'll, we'll go around, and if you tell what you've got, you can see I have a lovely peacock feather, right? That, there, it was, there it was. I don't know where it came from, but I got a peacock feather. What, what did you get? Two cans of corn. Two cans of corn. All right. May? An elephant. An elephant. A statue of an elephant? Oh, an elephant. Whoa. Amazing. All right. And you? A deck of cards. Deck of cards? A sweater. Sweater. Nice. Does it fit? Yep. Yeah, good. Yes? Slice of an apple. Slice of an apple. Good. You got me a box of bouncy balls. A bouncy balls. Great. That's good. Caramel corn. Caramel corn. Dancing shoes. Dancing shoes. Oh, what color are they? Pink. Pink. Lovely. Yeah? Baseball. A baseball. An iPod. Nice work. Yeah, <laughs> Your laundry. Right in that box. Good. A cat? L live cat. Yeah, nice. Hang on to that. Family pictures. Were they in frames or, or separate? Just loose uh, photos. Good. Amy? A rose? An earthen pot. What color? Earth. Good. <laughs> nice. Running shoes, outstanding. A kitten. A kitten. A piece of unknown material. A piece of unknown. Could you kind of describe what it is? Because sometimes we don't know what it is. But uh, no, it's just rough edges, shiny and light. Rough edges, shiny and light. Translucent. Translucent. Wow, neat. Okay. Uh, baby rattle. Baby rattle. Uh huh. A book. Book. Uh, pick it up. Uh, read the title. Ah, by Ogden Nash, great. Yes? My uh, lunch money for tomorrow. Lunch money for tomorrow. <laughs> In coins or cash? Both. Both, okay, good. Wooden egg. Wooden egg? I got one of those uh, things that you shake, you know, it's Oh, a snow, uh, yeah, like a paperweight. Snow globe. Snow globe, thank you. Yeah. Building blocks. Building blocks? Rubrics cube, cool. And horny toad, a live one, yeah. Okay. Turtle, splendid. Hammer. A hat. Shoes. Some sand and a rock. Chocolate, lovely. Uh huh. Oh, okay. A dead lizard. Sorry about that. Yeah, I will. Get those air holes in there. Good. Oh, good. I'm glad it was there. Ballet slippers. Nice. Whoa. Looking for this one, maybe. Okay, good. Okay. Squirrels uh, that are AWOL at this point. <laughs> What'd you get? Bicycle shoes. Nice. Yellow silly putty, Dalla. A little diamond ring. In, okay. My wife's left shoe. Your wife's left shoe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. A book. What's the title of the book you got? 
Secrets of Ancient Wisdom. Very good. A retro ashtray. Outstanding. Oh, oh, slime. Eww. Glow in the dark slime. Nice. A small garden gnome. Stacking pin. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, there's, a, um, there's a story about a cartoon in which the, um, the Dalai Lama is opening such a box, and he looks, looks in the box, and, uh, and, and he finally says, oh, it's nothing, just what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, a run over iPod. I bet it was. Wow, there's a laptop in that box. All right, on and working. A plastic Christmas tree. Yes? A plastic snake. I'm going to keep going until we all tell. Yeah? A sweater. What color? Green. Baseball cards. Ceramic frog and a used ashtray. Oh, ceramic frog and a used ashtray? A pair of sandstone bookends. Excellent. Anyone in the way back got a present? Wanted to tell us about it? Okay. Sorry to bother you back there. All right. <laughs> okay. Amazing. All right. Now, um, did anyone struggle with the moment of finding what's in the box or have some kind of angst about what it could be or anything? If that happens, I would say that's normal. Uh, it may be part of, I think that's part of an old tape that is our responsible selves wanting to, wanting to create something. Or something like, I'd like to come up with a good idea here. Isn't that sensible? If you're going to come up with an idea, don't you want to come up with a good idea? Of course. But in improv, trying to come up with a good idea will get in the way of coming up with an idea. So what we, we learn to do is to see what's in the box rather than putting something there. If we put something there, if I sort of think of something that would show off my creative talent in some way and put it in the box so that when I open it, I can say I found it, it's a different process. And sometimes we have to go through that for a while before we discover that there's always something in the box. Reality puts it there. In fact, the fact that we had, what, 50 of us here with basically different things, even though there were a couple of cats, I'll bet if I ask you to describe the cats, they would have been different. What that is is a testament to our individuality. We can't help but be original even when we don't do anything. The problem comes when we try, try to be original. We try to add uh, something there, to come up with a good idea is the language that we commonly use. When we study improvisation, we keep opening, in a sense, metaphorically anyway, imaginary boxes and see what shows up. And then instead of trying to get a good gift in the box, we take whatever emerges and make something out of it. So it's a change of mindset where the improviser is... Um, the ultimate ecologist, he or she uses everything that's there and finds a way to make it, um, make something out of it. There's a the, sort of the rule you don't reject anything, the rule of no blocking in improv. Improvisers always say yes. That's the first rule of improv, yes, to whatever is asked, whatever is in, intuited, whatever is mentioned, the improviser goes along with the plan and adds to it. So there's the rule of yes and. And that's the magic, that's the secret that players can jump on stage and begin a scene and it keeps going. And um, someone watching an improvised scene might think, oh, they must have figured out in the back room, let's do the one about the time when, when you're the mother-in-law and I find you smoking in the bedroom. Um, they don't need to do that. In fact, some kind of... Um, pre-planned agreement just gets in the way of making sense out of what's really happening. So natural improvising is so much easier than uh, what 
we often imagine improvisers are doing. When I ask you what you think of when you think of improvising, it's very common to hear comedy, that there's a kind of connection in the mind, especially the, the TV shows, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, and there was a recent one, oh dear, I think it's gone now, but um, where um, some famous actors were brought on stage and at the last minute given a scenario and they had to improvise the dialogue. What was that? Thank God you're here. Thank God you're here. Okay. Um, it was, uh, the show didn't, didn't last very long, uh, I think partly because um, there were sort of a couple of fallacies with it. One, the, the whole premise was, woo, it must be really hard to improvise. Golly, how could anybody on camera come up with something without knowing what it is? But they put the actors in a Valkyrie helmet with a, a breastplate and a sword, and they walk onto a set where there are a bunch of other Vikings standing. And it really isn't rocket science to kind of figure out anything you'd say there is likely to get a laugh, which is what the show's trying to do. Improvising is not about being clever, but it's really about making sense. I suggest to my improvisers, don't make jokes, make sense. And there's something marvelous about what happens when you make sense out of what's going on. So that if we were playing a scene and we started it with one improviser handing the other a shoebox, and the improviser opened it and found, ah, a clay, uh, it was a clay pot. We'd have the beginning of a story. The premise would then be, we accept that, that a clay pot was there, um, and we'd find a reason why that clay pot has some meaning. We might even play a game where we find something and the other player tells a story about it. So the rule of yes and, if I was to do an instant improv session, let's learn improv in three easy lessons. The first would be to say yes to everything and then add something. The second rule would be to make mistakes, which I understand is, is part of Google culture. Is, is that true? I mean, I know it's sort of in the literature. You really feel like you're able to uh, screw up and make mistakes in what you're doing here? Mm, I sort of, yeah. I, I understand. Um, because uh, the making mistakes thing is, is tricky. You can't really accomplish something if you're not on the edge where um, you might say failure or an unexpected outcome is possible. And yet none of us like the feeling of, of making a mistake or screwing up. But an improviser gets good at, um, I would say, I don't think they like making a mistake either, but they get comfortable with what you do when a mistake happens. And one of the things you do when a mistake happens is, um, I can teach you right now, we'll all learn this, it's called the circus bow. If you'd stand up, please. We've been sitting a long time anyway, so wiggle your buns, wiggle your shoulders. Okay. So when an improviser uh, screws up or drops their juggling balls or the equivalent, instead of going, oh, rats, how did I do that? They raise their hands in the air and to the left and right say, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Would you join me? Ta-da. Ta-da! Ta-da! Yes! All right. You can sit back down. Now, the usefulness of that, that's the uh, response to a mistake, a screw-up, um, imagined or otherwise, is that once you've done something that produces an unexpected or an unwanted result, where should your attention be? Yes? Right. Happens, happens. Yes. What qualifies, as, what, what qualifies for these circuits? Great. Uh, that's a wonderful question because pretty, pretty soon um, you, don't, you wouldn't need it. It's sort of a tool on the way to discovering that if I did something that was unexpected, the trained improviser would then just use that right away and make sense out of it. They wouldn't have to say, oh, mistake. But in the on the road to uh, turning around something into something useful, the, a common response to a mistake is to go 
I call it the palm frond, where you curl into yourself. How did I do that? Ugh. So you try to look at the mistake from the vantage point of what went wrong. And so if instead of what went wrong or turning inward on the problem, you look outward, da da, your attention is on what's coming next. So the idea of the ta-da bow is, all right, the something happened different than I expected, what comes next? And it's the what comes next moment where we have, it's our point of power, you might say, a point of creativity. We all know wonderful examples of something that was um, designed for something else that turned into a great benefit. I think I heard that Viagra was supposed to be some drug for um, rheumatism or something like that. And then they just discovered it had this, this other effect. So uh, somebody was paying attention, obviously, uh, with, with some of the dr <laughs> drug trials, I guess. You know. um, so um, it's funny when I, when I try to encourage people to make mistakes, um, since we don't really like that, it's, it's, a, it's a strange um, cultural thing. Nobody really wants to make them. You want to create an environment where mistakes are, or things that we don't want or don't expect are just part of the landscape. They're just another thing that can happen. And if they roll off your shoulders in that way, we're more likely to try things that are out of our comfort zone because the making mistakes part is really moving into territory that feels not quite like I'm in control anymore. Improvisers are, in a way, out of control. And yet, they are making sense in that uncontrolled environment. Um, let's do something for a moment. We've, uh, I've, been, I've been talking way too much. Close your eyes. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath. Kind of let any tension roll out of your body. And let's see how we are in terms of our uh, attention. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. Hold the answer to these questions in your, in your mind. And um, see. we'll check later to see how, um, how well you're doing. Don't open your eyes until I say so. OK, first question. Um, describe in your mind what I am wearing today. Could you draw a picture of me from head to foot uh, in some detail of what my outfit is like, um, what any accessories I have on, the color and texture of my um, costume, my couture today? What am I wearing? Question number two. The lighting sources in this room, what are they? Uh, and um, what different kind of light uh, allows us to see each other and to see me? Um, uh, extra credit if you know how many lighting fixtures or sources of light there are. Okay, next question. The chairs in this room are, um, are colorful. What are, what are the colors of the chairs in the room? Uh, next question. Um, are there any exit signs in your visual field that would tell you which direction to go if you needed to evacuate this room? Are there any fire extinguishers in this room? Next question. Um, how many and what kind of board is on the back wall behind where I'm standing right now. Is there anything written on, on the board or boards? Could you describe the size and shape and color of what is, um, is behind me today? The, let's see. The ceiling of this room has a distinct design. What's the ceiling look like? And the last question is, can you, do you know who's sitting to either side of you? You might know their names, or um, if you don't, what, what their face or what they look like. The people sitting on either side of you. OK, open your eyes now, and let's check out reality, how we're 
how well we uh, have observed the, the world of this room, what I look like, and the uh, lighting sources, the ceiling design here. OK. The two. Good, I see you're looking around, checking it all out here. Did anybody get 100%? Got everything right? Raise your hand. No, OK, good. Good for being honest. Yeah. All right. More important than if you got 100% on the quiz is um, what do you notice now about the world that we're in that you maybe hadn't noticed before? Hey. Yes. Yeah. Cool. OK. Be warned there. That's where it is. Thank you for noticing that. Mm -hmm. I, I used knowledge that there was an exit sign there. I'd forgotten there was a curtain blocking it. Aha. So there was something. I used knowledge rather than perception. OK, good. Yes. Uh -huh. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, because that is, um, that is often, um, I often have that experience, too. And I'm trying to pay attention to the physical world or the world around me. It's, to me, um, it's something I suggest that you try several times a day. Wherever you are, you think, oh, I'm sitting in my office. I know this place. Or I'm sitting out in a familiar environment or in my car or something, close your eyes and see if you can describe the environment that you're in, and then open them again. We are often um, surrounded by incredible detail of a physical world. Not just, it's not just how many lights are in the room that are important, but um, waking up to what is actually here is a really big part of improvising. And it's a constant challenge, I think even more so for folks like yourself who are often way into your minds and off into a, the depth of a screen and, and a technical problem, that we might be moving through reality, bumping into each other, and never realizing how amazing it is to have these chairs that are red, blue, and yellow. They're phenomenal. So I encourage you to challenge yourself to re-enter the um, physical world um, paying attention. If you think about it, what we're paying attention to is our world. Um, if we're worrying about a project that we're not doing now because we're sitting and listening to me, that becomes the locus of our attention. The cool thing, the good news about attention, is you can return your, you can you can train your attention the way you could train a small child. Um, the Buddhists have the notion of a monkey mind, of your mind jumping all over the place. If you've ever tried to meditate or concentrate, you may notice how your mind has a mind of its own. But um, what we can do is, when we notice our mind is off somewhere else, we can return it to what's important to us. Sometimes the best training is just to return yourself to where you are right now. I will sometimes, um, if I find myself especially anxious or spinning or uh, in, a, in a whirl, mentally or psychologically, I'll ask myself three questions. I'll first say, where are you, Patricia, right now? And then I'll say out loud, I am driving on Highway 280 at 83 miles an hour. <laughs> so that's the question, where are you? I'm driving. Uh, second question is, um, what are you doing right now? So I might say, I am furious because I forgot to do so and so and I'm late for this and that. Um, what am I supposed to be doing? Driving carefully. So the third question then, what needs to be done to um, improve this moment? I often forget where I am because I'm spinning. So, ah. I'll notice, I'll ask those three questions, and I'll slow down a little bit, take a breath, return to my body, and try to drive more carefully and safely. Um, um, we're here, all of us, 
thanks to the efforts of a lot of other people. And we might sort of understand that at a, at a conceptual level. Of, yeah, of course, there are a lot of folks that, uh, whose work has greased my path. Or I'd like for you to take a couple of moments and um, see if you can um, make a list of the people thanks to whom you are here today. All of us exist thanks to the efforts of others. And maybe those others are simply maybe doing their job. But without them doing their job, we wouldn't, for example, be nourished. There was um, someone in the, in the, uh, in the kitchen, um, in, in the food preparation area today, today that ladled out some barbecue sauce on that delicious meatloaf um, that I had for lunch. And it's thanks to his work that I got that sauce and was able to be nourished today. So he might be on my list. I don't know his name, but I saw him. So take a moment right now, and can you come up with at least five people thanks to whom you're here right now? Can you just I'll take a couple of minutes and think about who, else, who else's efforts made it possible for you to be here today? Okay, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry, because I know this conversation could probably go on for a while, and I'm just noticing that we're at 3.30. It um, seems to me really important to keep opening your eyes to things not only the color of the furniture and paying attention to the physical world, but also, in particular, to all of those whose work serves us, who makes our life possible. If Improvisers are good improvisers. They are, um, they are steeped in an understanding of gratitude. To me, the heart of improvising is um, the observation of what others are doing and building upon that. And not just what others are doing in some special way, but especially the things that others do in a routine way, never taking for granted the, the amazing world that we're in, the world of, of um, starting with our, our, our parents who, whose um, efforts uh, brought us to life. And uh, so I've often thought that the whole, um, the sort of globalization of thanks for everything is a kind of cop-out. And that better than thanks for everything is to look at the detail of what that everything represents. Um, we're all longing, I think, for acknowledgement. And so a good way to, I think, um, to help others is to notice what they've done and, um, and thank them in appreciation. Now, I, this talk today is to be divided into two parts, sort of the talk, which I guess we've sort of had. And I'd, um, I might have something. Um, something official to say before I begin. But after that, I, will, I would like to be able to sign books for about um, uh, up to 10 minutes. And then anyone who needs to may leave. And anyone who wants to stay and play some more improv games, um, the second half up till, uh, let's see, 3.30 to 4.30 is sort of, quote, a workshop or some interactive, more stuff with me. So if you've got the next hour free, I'm going to um, do, some, do some more things talk less at you. But um, before, before, I, uh, before I do that, I wanted to read just a, a, a little tiny bit from the end of, uh, the end of my book. <clears throat> I've always been moved by the Buddhist story of the blind turtle. It's a teaching fable designed to illustrate the concept of precious human rebirth the wonder of the gift of human life. According to the legend, a man threw a wooden yoke into the sea, and it drifted around, tossed by winds east and west. Once every hundred years, a blind turtle would rise from the bottom of the sea and swim to the surface. How often, do you imagine, will this turtle poke his head through the floating ring? These are the odds we have of being given a human rebirth, according to the ancients. It seems wrong to waste it, don't you think? So years ago, I wrote this fable to illustrate this urgency. 
And the fable is called The Water Tank. In the small town of Tuvita, Tuvida, water allotment was legislated. And when a child was born, the council, town council held a drawing and assigned the child's water allowance for life. Now, the lottery was random, so one might receive anything from 100 to 100 million gallons. The water was stored in a giant cylinder in each person's backyard. And there was a tap on the side of the tank. Now, to the eye, everyone's tank appeared the same. It was enormous and could easily hold enough water for 70 to 100 years of use. Now, the difference, of course, was that the amount of water inside each tank varied. And there was no way to determine how much there was. So the citizens of Tuvita dealt with this reality in a variety of ways. One man kept records of all the water used by everyone for the past 50 years, and he created a, a chart showing the statistical probabilities for the amount of water each person was likely to have been given. Some townsfolk rationed the water parsimoniously, never even planting a garden for fear of overusing their supply. Some put in hot tubs, water fountains, and swimming pools to celebrate their imagined bounty. One fellow built a huge lake for fishing, boating, and swimming to share with his neighborhood. However, the one thing that no one ever chose to do was to turn on the spigot and just let the water run freely. Of course, occasionally while a person was watering his lawn, he'd forget. But no one consciously wasted it. How would you use your water allotment if you lived in Tuvida? Think of the minutes in your life as drops of water from the tank. Your tap isn't dripping, is it? So every moment counts, every minute counts. We don't know um, how long we have on the Earth. We hope it's a long, long time. But I want to encourage every one of us to use each minute well. And that might mean now uh, going to the bathroom or getting lunch or going on to your next thing. And uh, for anyone who'd like, I'd be delighted to sign your books. And uh, it's been an honor to be here today.